Now we're going to talk a little bit more about typography and text and how you go about creating artistic text in Photoshop. Text has the power to make or break a design and Photoshop Create a Cloud has a lot to offer when it comes to typography and text. You're able to create and edit text in a variety of formats and fonts. But it's important to remember when creating text that legibility is key. It doesn't do any good at all to have something written out if the viewer can't read it. You need to make sure that it's relatable to the design and complements the design as well. Now one thing to go ahead and say and get out of the way is Photoshop isn't really the correct Adobe for doing typography and layout design. That's normally going to be done using InDesign, but you can effectively create layouts, etc. in Photoshop. And we're going to go over some basics of typography, some basic things to remember for those times when you will be using text in your designs in Photoshop. Now some of the biggest mistakes that people make when using type is by overusing decorative fonts and using too many fonts per design. It's important to remember that just because you have access to a lot of decorative or crazy looking fonts, you don't have to use them, especially not all in one document. If you're going to use a decorative font, you might use it for one or two words, not the entire document. Another mistake is setting whole sentences in capital letters. All capped text takes longer for people to read because they're not used to it. And it tends to imply that people are yelling at someone. And so you want to make sure that you format your text correctly. Along those same lines, you don't want to underline your text unless it's a hyperlink. So only underline text that links to something else. When it comes to alignment, you don't want to center large bodies of text. It should be left justified or right justified, but you don't center large amounts of text. And then when it comes to quotation marks, you don't want to misuse straight and smart quotation marks and apostrophes. So the straight lines indicate units of measurement, whereas the curly ones are used for everything else. So for inches, feet, etc., straight up and down is used. Everything else you use the curly quotes. Additionally, hyphens, in dashes, and m dashes tend to be an area that people have a hard time with. So let's go ahead. T is the shortcut for the type tool. I'm just going to click and I'm going to write out example change this from italic to regular. Go ahead and highlight it first, change it to regular. And at the end, I'm going to hold down my shift key and put my quotes. Those are curly quotes. Now if I wanted to have straight quotes, I can go into my preferences. I can go into my preferences and select type and undo my smart quotes, click OK. Now if I select my type tool again, click over here, and I have straight quotes now. So the smart quotes are curled and unit quotes are straight up and down. I'm gonna go ahead and reset back to smart quotes and type again, and I'm going to turn use smart quotes back on. Now another area that people tend to get confused is in using hyphens, in dashes, and m dashes. So let's go ahead and type something out here to demonstrate. Now a hyphen is used when you're combining two words. Demonstrate dash text. That's when you would use a hyphen. However, if you were replacing the word two, like chapters one to four, you would use an in dash. So let me 
come down here and we'll do chapter one and then if I just do like that one to four that's a hyphen and an in dash is a little bit longer than a hyphen and in order to get an in dash what you would need to do is if you're on a Mac you hold down the option key and hit the hyphen so I'm holding down my alter option and my hyphen and I get the in dash for one to four and on a PC you would hold down control and hold down the minus sign on your numpad. Now the third kind of a dash or hyphen is an M dash and these are the longest of the three different types. So an M dash is used when you want to signify an abrupt halt or change in speech. So. abrupt halt and in order to get an M dash what you do is on a Mac you hold down your shift alt or option key in the dash and on a PC you would hold control and alt and then press the minus sign on your numpad now a third area that a lot of people have a hard time with is properly spacing the ellipsis whenever omitting part of a sentence or continuing a thought, etc. And you can do that by typing the three periods. That's the most common way people do it. But you could also just go ahead and do it in Photoshop by holding down your Alt or Option key and the semicolon that will automatically place that there for you. And if you're on a PC, then all you have to do is hold down Alt and type in 0133 on your numpad and that will place the ellipses for you. Another common mistake often made with text is to double space at the end of a sentence after the period correct form is a single space after the period. Back when people were using typewriters, they would double space at the end of a sentence to make it easier to read. Now that we're using computers, things are a little more legible. Single spacing at the end of sentences is correct form. Now let's talk about the different types of fonts for a moment. Now essentially each character for a font represents what would have been a glyph or it's a graphical representation of a letter, number, punctuation mark, etc. In digital, this is called a typeface or a font. Now technically, a typeface is the overall shape or design of the glyph and a font is the specific size, style, and weight. However, People use these two terms interchangeably and going forward, I will be referring to them as fonts. Additionally, you may also encounter the term font family and this is a collection of various weights and widths of the same design. An example of a font family is Futura Book, Futura Semi Bold, Futura Heavy, Futura Bold, Futura Extra Bold, and so on. Additionally, you can see all different types of font families. Right here you see the Arial font family with Arial, Regular, Italic, Bold, Bold Italic, Narrow, Narrow Bold, etc. So these are all a different type of font family. Now there are three different common font formats, and those are PostScript, TrueType, and OpenType. And PostScript is one that has been preferred by many graphic designers because they consider it one of the safest and most reliable for printing. It's been around for a long time. And each PostScript font consists of two files. One that contains the shapes that get displayed on screen called the screen or bitmap file along with the font family and spacing information 
and another that contains the outline drawings of each glyph for the printer, and this is known as the printer file. Now this format produces high quality text when printed on postscript devices like laser printers and professional printing presses. Now one drawback to using a postscript font is that if the two different files become separated or one gets lost or corrupted, it can make the font unusable. Another font type is the true type font. And you can see these with the TT over here in my font menu. And these were developed jointly by Apple and Microsoft. And this is actually the most common font format. As we go through our menu, you can see lots of the TT fonts here. One thing that's nice is that both the on-screen and outline information are stored in just one file, so that makes it a little bit e That limits the potential for losing any information on the fonts. And even though these fonts are equal in quality to PostScript and are becoming increasingly used by graphic designers, a lot of professional printers still prefer the PostScript fonts out of habit. Now some true type fonts for Windows can be used on Mac machines. However, a true type font that's been created for a Mac is not compatible with a Windows machine. And the last type of font is the open type font. You can see these with the O's. And these are similar with the true type font in that there's only one file that contains the screen and outline information together. They work well, look the same on both Macs and Windows computers, and they are able to store more than 65,000 different glyphs in one font file. This makes them work really well for pictorial font types, such as the type that Asian and Middle Eastern languages use. Now, one form of these is the typekit fonts that are being used between Adobe applications and we'll be going over typekit fonts in a future lesson. Now, let's talk about various font categories. Here we see examples of the serif font. And a serif font has little lines or serifs that resemble tiny little feet extending from the letter's main strokes. Now, the main strokes in a serif font vary from thick to thin, and the serifs help lead the eye as you're reading through copy. Now, serifs are great for large bodies of printed text like books, newspapers, magazines, where it's really important to have good legibility. However, they're not very good for online reading. Some examples include Times New Roman, Garamond, Minion, Cambria. Here's a list of several ones here. Now, a sans serif font is a font that does not have those little feet or leading lines off the main lines in the font. And they're great for headlines, subheads, and online body copy. You can resize these very small on phones, etc., and it doesn't become cluttered. Now, because the main strokes are uniform and don't vary from thick to thin, as you can see here, they display well at small sizes. Some examples include Arial, Helvetica, and Futura. Now a slab serif font often looks like it's bold. And these have uniform main strokes. You see the feet are back, just like we saw in the serif fonts. However, in a serif font, you have varying thickness of the lines. And here you see they're all the same. These are best used when you want to attract attention or when printing body copy under less than optimal conditions like cheap printer or fax, etc. Some examples include Bookman, Courier, and Rockwell. Now decorative fonts like we see here are best used in limited quantities. You use it for one or two words, maybe just for one or two letters when you want to draw attention to something. However, using decorative fonts or display fonts can affect the legibility, and so it's best to use them in limited quantities. Some examples of these include Impact, Party, and Stencil. Now, script fonts are also 
a good example of a font that should be used in limited quantities. These fonts try to emulate handwriting and a lot of times cursive. And some of them are very formal, such as we see here. And as with all fonts, it's best to match your font with what you're doing. So the fancier script fonts should be limited to things like wedding invitations, etc. Some examples include Brush Script, Freestyle, and Edwardian. Now, earlier I discussed different font styles or font families, and that's a good way of identifying various formats of the same font, like what we saw here with Arial. If I change this to Arial Regular, then I can change it to Arial Italic, Arial Bold, Bold Italic, etc. Those are font styles and those are built-in styles. Now I can also come over here and I can select my regular font and I can choose a style of regular italic bold or bold italic. It's important to mention that not all fonts contain a bold or italic style and if they don't then you can go to the character panel and you can do a faux bold or a faux italic in the drop down menu over here. However, it's important to mention that it's best not to. Photoshop will do its best to make the characters look thicker or tilt them, creating a simulated or faux style. And sometimes these look good on the computer screen, but they don't print very well at all because there's not an outline to go by. So it's always better if you need a bold font that rather than use faux bold or faux italic, you select a different font that actually has that font style available. Now, if you want to preview what a font is going to look like, you can make sure that you have your layer selected with that character. And then you can go over here in the character panel and you can scroll through the different fonts using your arrow keys and you can see over in the left on my document that as I scroll through all of my different fonts, it is changing my type on that layer so that I can preview what that would look like. Additionally, I can click on my drop down menu and out to the right. There's an example of the font written with the word sample out to the right of it as well. Now if you want to make them larger, then all you have to do is go to the Type menu and select Font Preview Size and what size you would like for it to be. And you see that now in my menu it's a lot larger. And once again that was under Type, Font Preview Size, and we have several options to choose from there. And so that's it for a brief overview on fonts, basic typography, and Photoshop.